Welcome back, everyone. Episode 26. We knew it. Okay, so the first half of this episode is essentially a recap of the entire series thus far. Well, kind of. While this episode does serve to go over everything that's transpired in the story up until the death of Ryuzaki, it only does it from his perspective. And there's a specific reason why it's done that way that'll be revealed near the end of the recap. Now, I had originally considered skipping the first half of this episode since it's technically filler, seeing as all of the clips and audio during this portion of the episode are reused, but after actually sitting down and watching it again, I felt like it is worth going over, if only briefly. And the reason I feel that way is because by zeroing in on Ryuzaki's point of view throughout the entire investigation, looking at how he reacted to new information as it was presented to him, as well as the ways in which he went about trying to figure out Kida's identity, we get a better understanding of really just how phenomenal a detective he was. And look, I'm not going to discount the fact that Light beat Ryuzaki, and that really <laughs> everything has gone according to Keikaku for Light time and time and time again. But to be fair, Light has had a lot of shit just kind of fall in his lap. Like, a lot of shit. I mean, let's break it down real quick. For starters, Ryuk told him that he was being followed. You're being followed by another human. He's watching you right now. He just so happened to run into Naomi right before she was going to expose him. I can't help but think that it must be fate that I met you today. Ryuk helped Light find the cameras and wiretaps. There sure are a lot of cameras in this room. I counted 64 in total. Misa and Rim popped up out of fucking nowhere and both of them just so happened to be subservient to him in one way or another. I already told you I don't care even if all you do is use me. I will kill L for you. The chief refused to believe that his son could be Kira. <gasps> no light! And Ryuk went ahead and wrote those fake rules in the notebook for him. Fine then, Light, I'll do it. Like, to say that this man isn't extremely lucky would be disingenuous, honestly. And my point in saying all of that is, this episode serves to show us just how much Ryuzaki was able to accomplish, essentially, on his own. Like, starting on December 5th, 2006, we have Ryuzaki correctly deducing the fact that Kira is in the Kanto region of Japan, based on the fact that Kira killed that one dude during a hostage situation a week prior on November 28th. And this was something that no one else seemed to have noticed. Furthermore, Ryuzaki also managed to bitch Kira out by way of proving that they couldn't kill someone whose identity they couldn't confirm. Now, from there, we see that Ryuzaki isn't exactly infallible, that he is capable of <laughs> taking an L himself, because on December 27th, he ended up losing the 12 FBI agents that he had sent to Japan. But he made sure to not let their deaths be in vain, as he was able to determine that the criminal's deaths that occurred a week prior, on December 19th, must have been the result of Kida conducting experiments on inmates to see just how much he could manipulate a person's actions before ultimately using that knowledge to kill all 12 of the FBI agents who were working in Japan. Not only that, but during the first week of January 2007, when Ryuzaki became aware of Naomi Misada's disappearance, it led to him taking a second look at Ray Penber and the people he was tailing in the days leading up to his and the other agents' deaths, which ultimately led him directly to the Yagami family. At this point, I'd like to focus our investigation on only those people who Ray Penber was tailing. Deputy Director Kitamura, as well as Detective Superintendent Yagami and their families. Like, Ryuzaki was able to piece all of this together, essentially on his own, within about a month's time. Like, don't get me wrong, at this point the MPA and FBI have been excellent in regards to providing him with information to analyze, but he's really been the driving force behind closing in on Kira. And honestly, at this point in the investigation, as the focus shifts towards looking into the Yagami family, specifically the chief son, Light Yagami, Ryuzaki's close relationship with the NPA kind of becomes less of a benefit and more of a hindrance. That's my son you're talking about. Are you honestly telling me that you suspect him? Now from there, it shows us Ryuzaki honing in on Light Yagami as a suspect. And as I said earlier, we're only viewing this from Ryuzaki's perspective, meaning this is the point wherein Light is introduced during this recap. Up until this point, Ryuzaki hasn't actually had a clear suspect in mind. Like, yes, we, as the audience, obviously know that Light is Kira, but at this point, Ryuzaki is just investigating him because the trail just so happened to lead him here. Like the fact that he knows Kira is in the Kanto region of Japan, that their actions implied that they might be a student, that confidential information was stolen from someone who had access to it, that Ray Penber behaved strangely before he died, that Ray's fiance, someone who Ryuzaki knew professionally, was also suddenly missing, adding more credence to the fact that Ray might have just 
grasping the FBI agent who was following Kitta. And by looking into the people that Rei was tailing during the period just before his death, it led Riyazaki to two families, one of which was the Yagami family. And yeah, without taking anything that we know about Light into account, the information that Riyazaki unearthed during the investigation led him straight to Light. And so, after investigating him for several months, Riyazaki decides on April 5th, 2007, to take the next step and make contact. I want to tell you I'm hell. Now, on April 13th, less than two weeks after Ryuzaki confronts Light, we see that Kida has reached out to the folks at Sakana TV, instructing them to air a tape on April 18th. And once that happens, well, chaos ensues, as several people wind up dying. Two news anchors, as well as three police officers, one of which is Ukita. And despite being... Quite frankly, terrified by what was going on, Rizaki managed to quickly come to the conclusion that this incident was the work of someone else, a second Kira, which none of the other members of the task force even considered, once again showing us just how impressive his skills are. He's consistently shown to be far more intelligent than the other members of the team. And this is important to keep in mind, especially when we take into account that on April 23rd, a few days after the Sakura TV incident, we see Ryuzaki call on Light to help with the investigation, essentially evoking the idea of keeping your friends close, but your enemies closer. And in bringing him on, Light goes on to show that he's just as impressive as Ryuzaki, as he immediately came to the same conclusion as Ryuzaki that the Kira who made the broadcast is a different Kira than the one who's been killing up until now. This then leads to Light joining the investigation as they all work together to find the second Kira before they're able to make contact with the original. However, Rizaki does make a point to let the members of the task force know that while they will be working alongside Light, they still need to keep an eye on him. When you two are working together, I want you to keep a close eye on Light the entire time. Also, Mr. Yagami, please ask Mr. Mobi to start following Light so he can keep tabs on what he's doing. <laughs> So essentially, Ryuzaki's thought process is to kind of use Light as bait, hoping that his appearance in Aoyama on May 22nd will cause the second Kira to make their presence known. Not only that, but given the fact that this second Kira is so adamant in regard to their desire to meet the real Kira, Ryuzaki has Mogi start tailing Light in the hopes that the second Kira will reach out to him. Because to be clear, at this point, Ryuzaki feels fairly certain that Light is Kira. And he becomes even more sure of that once Mogi informs him on May 27th that Light is dating Misa Amane. Because while Light is seen dating multiple women, such as Kiyomi Takara, Misa is a bit of an outlier. And part of the reason she comes across as such an anomaly is because, unlike Takara and the other girls who he's willing to be seen with in public, Light seems to be keeping Misa a secret. Anyway, from there, Ryuzaki moves in to apprehend her, and from my point of view, there are three main reasons why he would do this. The first would be what I just mentioned in regard to Light keeping his relationship with her a secret. The second would be because she's gone on record saying that she came to Japan to meet Kira. And the third would be the fact that, well, she's blonde. And I know that third one sounds kind of weird, but the task force had strands of Misa's hair because they were with the tapes that she had sent into Sakura TV. So I imagine when Mogi mentioned that Light was dating a blonde woman, that, <laughs> in and of itself, immediately set off an alarm for Ryuzaki. And when you combine that with the other two things I just mentioned, it makes sense why he moved in to arrest her the very next day on May 28th. But yeah, with Misa in custody, Ryuzaki goes ahead and spends the next few days trying to get her to confess. But despite his, uh, unorthodox techniques, she never actually confesses to anything. However, surprisingly, her arrest does end up leading to Light turning himself in a few days later on June 1st. Ryuzaki, like I said over the phone, I could be Kira. And it's at this point in the investigation that we see Ryuzaki kind of start to lose control, because unfortunately, he now has to lock Light up, despite not necessarily wanting to do it just yet. And doing this is especially problematic due to the fact that back on April 7th, when they met with Light's father in the hospital, Light seemed to want Ryuzaki to do this exact thing. What if you were to lock me up for a month in a place with no TV or any other kind of access to the outside world and keep a constant watch over me? And at the time, Ryuzaki shut that shit down, saying it'd be insane to take advice from his suspect on how to prove himself innocent. It's complete nonsense for the investigator to take suggestions from his suspect. Which, yeah, he was right to say that. But unfortunately, with Light coming at him saying that he thinks he is actually Kira, Ryuzaki's hands are 
pretty much tied, and he doesn't have a choice but to appease Light and follow through with locking him up. And this is where things get really weird for Ryuzaki, because all of a sudden, both Light and Misa are acting completely different. Misa has gone from asking to be killed, even going so far as to try and do it herself, to acting like Ryuzaki is some kind of stalker who's holding her there because she's famous. And Light, who was apparently convinced that he might actually be Kida, is all of a sudden saying that he's been set up and that there's no way that he could be Kida. All of this on top of the fact that Kida is still killing while both of them are locked up. So it's just, I mean, the entire investigation has been flipped on its head. Everything that pointed at Light being Kida is suddenly evaporating before Ryuzaki's eyes and he can't make sense of it. And weeks go by with the investigation essentially stagnating, likely because Ryuzaki's focus was solely on Light and Misa. Anyway, after 50 days on July 20th, Ryuzaki enacts a plan that has the chief threatening to murder Light. Working under the impression that if Light and Misa were Kida and the second Kida, then they would do whatever it takes to ensure that that didn't happen. Ryuzaki was of the belief that if Light was Kida, then he would have no problem sacrificing his father in order to survive. Which, I mean... Anyway, and if Misa was the second Kida, then she'd have no problem killing the chief in order to save Light. So, when they conduct the test and the chief isn't killed, then they go on to assume that Light and Misa, at the very least, are not currently acting as the Kidas. Which, I mean, in hindsight, that test was hella flawed. But at the time, Ryuzaki had no way of knowing that. Anyway, from there, we dive into the Yotsuba arc, which really kind of sees Ryuzaki take a step back from the investigation a little. Mostly due to his being depressed at the fact that he knows that Light and Misa were Kira, but it seems as though somehow that's no longer the case. And what I mean by him taking a step back is the fact that Light's the one who actually finds the connection between Yotsuba and Kira on October 1st. And this discovery once again served to put him on the same level as Ryuzaki, if not on a higher level given the fact that Ryuzaki didn't even pick up on it. And Light goes on to prove himself time and time again, as he essentially becomes the new driving force of the investigation. What with him managing to delay the deaths of innocent people on top of pocketing Namikawa as a potential mole while acting as L. And we'll actually put a pin in that last part for now and come back to it a little later. But yeah, after Matsuda exposes the eight members of the Yotsuba group on October 8th and Misa narrows it down to Higuchi on October 25th, we see Ryuzaki start to feel a bit better as he enacts a plan to expose Higuchi once and for all. The plan essentially involves tricking Higuchi into showing them how he kills, by way of utilizing a fake broadcast on Sakura TV. Which then leads to the events of October 28th and that whole crazy night. And I'm actually just now noticing that both of the most action-packed episodes of the series thus far stem from a broadcast coming out of Sakura TV. I just thought that was kind of interesting. But anyway, the night ultimately ends with the task force, assisted by members of the NPA, moving in to apprehend Higuchi and thus discovering the Death Note. With Ryuzaki commenting on the fact that There have to be two notebooks, possibly more. Then, as Ryuzaki's story nears its end, we see the team analyzing the rules of the notebook, with it being discovered that there's a rule that states that if the user of a death note fails to consecutively write names down for more than 13 days, they will die. Which, in turn, automatically lifts any suspicion from Light and Misa. Though, Ryuzaki isn't quite convinced, as he goes on to think, 13 days. That's the only problem. And that final quote from Ryuzaki is how the recap ends. Well, kind of. It actually ends when we switch to a computer screen that begins populating text that reads, The following is the record which contains everything I have investigated on the Kira incident. The fact that now you are reading this message means I am no longer alive at this moment. I hereby leave this record as my firm achievement. And yeah, everything we saw during the first half of this episode was meant to act kind of like Ryuzaki's case log, a record of everything he managed to uncover while working on this investigation. And as we just saw, he managed to do a lot, much of which was done on his own, honestly. Like up until Light and Misa were apprehended, it was pretty much him doing most of the heavy lifting. Well, metaphorically speaking, anyway. And Ryuzaki mentions the fact that this is his firm achievement, and he's right. 
Because while he did ultimately lose his battle with Kira, he still managed to get closer than anyone else in regard to figuring out who he was. Hell, I mean, he did figure out who Kira was. From the moment he singled out Light, he never wavered from his belief that he was Kira. The only reason Ryuzaki lost is because Light had a secret deus ex machina in his back pocket in the form of a Shinigami who just so happened to be willing to kill herself for a human who, quite frankly, couldn't give two shits about her. But whatever, I'm not gonna harp on it anymore. Ryuzaki is dead and there's nothing that can be done about it. So yeah. Anyway, after the message is displayed across the screen, we see it start to slowly disappear, as if it's being erased. And that's because it is, in fact, being erased by none other than Light Yagami. And it's interesting because the look on his face is kind of, well, it's kind of difficult to interpret. I mean, when we last saw him, he was on a high, feeling himself after getting rid of all of his enemies in one fell swoop. And honestly, he was right to feel that way. I mean, regardless of how it came about, it was still an impressive feat. But here, here he looks almost indifferent. And yet also, it feels like there's more to it than just indifference. Like this case log was all that really remained of Ryuzaki and now it's just gone, just like Ryuzaki himself. I feel like this moment is meant to be perceived as like kind of lamenting the death of Ryuzaki. And honestly, I think it's the perfect way to showcase it. To have Light go over all of Ryuzaki's notes on the case, to see just how much Ryuzaki was able to uncover throughout the investigation. I mean, as annoyed as Light was with Ryuzaki, I have to imagine that there's a part of him that has a great deal of respect for Ryuzaki's skill as a detective. I mean, how could he not? As someone who had aspired, or hell, still does aspire to become a detective himself, how could he look at all that Ryuzaki accomplished and not be impressed? Like, yes, as Kira, Ryuzaki was his greatest adversary, but as Light Yagami? I mean, this is someone who, in a different life, one wherein he didn't obtain the Death Note, could have been his mentor, or partner, or hell, even his friend. But yeah, I guess in wrapping this portion up, I want to also mention the fact that during this scene, the computer makes a long, continuous beeping noise after everything has been erased. It's kind of reminiscent of the way an EKG will let out a continuous beep when someone flatlines. You know, when their heart stops. I thought that that was a beautiful addition to this scene, kind of cementing the fact that Ryuzaki is, without a doubt, gone. And yeah. But anyway, welcome back to, nope, okay, still still not doing it. Uh, <laughs> definitely next time though. So things pick back up 10 days after Ryuzaki's funeral, with the remaining members of the task force having a quick discussion about what their next steps are now that Watari and Ryuzaki are gone. But before we get into that larger discussion, I wanted to briefly discuss Watari and Ryuzaki's identities, given the fact that Aizawa says, We know Watari's true identity now but we never found out anything about who Ryuzaki really was. And it's interesting because Light actually does know Ryuzaki's identity at this point. Or at the very least, he knows his real name. I mean, he would have to, given Ryuzaki's name would have been written in Rim's notebook. They never confirm it in the show, but if you're curious, Ryuzaki's real name was actually L. <laughs> like, I'm not even kidding. His real name was L. Lolliot. Go figure. Anyway, Matsuda mentions the fact that Watari was a famous inventor, with Aizawa also adding, The paper says he founded orphanages around the world. And this is referencing the orphanages known as the Whammy's House, which we got a glimpse of in the previous episode and which we'll see again a little later. And yeah, I was considering going over the article itself to see if there was anything interesting to find, but honestly, outside of the title, which reads, Father of Orphanages Around the Globe, Inventor Quillish Whammy Has Died, the rest of this shit is just <laughs> incoherent gibberish. Like, take this paragraph right here. The depth of sadness losing Mr. Plant derives from sad news at night and has increased further. Like this shit had me and my boy Clippy over here confused as hell. And <laughs> if you understood that reference, well, congratulations, you're officially old as fuck. <laughs> but also it's not just the grammar. Some of the information here is just outright wrong. Like from what I'm seeing, it says that Watani died at the age of 80, but other more credible sources claim that he was 71 at the time of his passing. So <laughs> like, what? But yeah, Aizawa goes on to say that, unfortunately, with Watari and Ryuzaki gone, they can't stay here anymore. Which makes sense. I doubt they could even afford to pay the electric bill for a place like this. And besides, what use would they realistically have for a building this big anyway? Now, from there, we turn our attention to Light, as the chief asks him how it's going with accessing the information on his computer, which... 
Wait a second. Now that I think about it, wasn't everything deleted already? Didn't we literally see that happen and have it confirmed by Rizaki? I told Watari to make sure that he should erase all information in the event that something were to happen to him. And yet, Light goes on to say, I should be able to transfer the system and most of the information out of here by tonight. Like, I'm sorry, what? What was the point of showing us Watari doing that with his final breath if all of the information is still there? Shit, now that I think about it, the whole first half of this episode is undercut by the fact that whatever document Light was reading should have already been deleted. I guess not everything was deleted, or maybe there's a time delay, or maybe he just put everything in the trash can and didn't get the opportunity to actually empty it? I'm, I'm not entirely sure, honestly. I guess just, <laughs> just don't think about it. Don't think about the fact that Watari's final moments, with him struggling, using every last ounce of his strength to complete Ryuzaki's final request of him, being ultimately irrelevant. Cool. Anyway, Light goes on to tell the others that he's created a voice filter identical to the ones that Ryuzaki and Watari used. He goes on to tell the others that they can use the program to make the police think that L and Watari are still alive, so that they can continue giving them orders, which, at first, I, I thought that was kinda weird. Like, these guys are all police officers again, and now they're going to willfully lie to their fellow officers and the general public by way of impersonating these two. But then, when I gave it some more thought, I realized that it's probably for the best, as I imagine the general public would likely not react well to finding out that the only person who was still going after Gitta is now dead. I mean, even if you did introduce a different L to replace the original, people probably wouldn't take them seriously. Like, they'd just be seen as a cheap copy of the original. Which is actually something to keep in mind going forward, but we'll talk more about that in the videos to come. Anyway, after this, Light goes on to pose three questions to the task force. Who is going to take the place of L? Where will he work from? And what do we do with the notebook? And these are important questions, especially the first one, because, I mean, who is worthy of inheriting the title of L? Now, there is an obvious choice. One might say, <laughs> when looking at this group, that there might be an only choice. And while I would agree that Light is the only person who could take on the mantle, I'm more so concerned with the idea of whether he should take on the mantle. Because, like, I can't help but feel like it's super fucked up that they'd want him to. And to be clear, they do want him to. And they even cite a specific reason for why they do, as Amatsuda ends up saying, Even Ryozaki said so himself. You would be capable of succeeding L. And it's honestly that justification that I have such an issue with. Because Ryuzaki admitted to only saying that because he wanted to test Light. Ryuzaki's theory is that once I steal L's title, I will become Kira again. Correct. So it's actually crazy that Matsuda would use that as an example of why Light should be L when Ryuzaki only ever said that in an attempt to prove that Light was Kira. Like, if anything, the thing Matsuda is referencing should be enough to disqualify Light as L's replacement on principle alone. Like, I get that they all believe that Light has been completely exonerated, and you know what? That's fine. I would expect nothing less from them. But Ryuzaki never shared that belief. In fact, on his last day alive, he was still openly suggesting the fact that Misa might be the person out there currently acting as Kida. These killings began as soon as Misa was free, didn't they? Not to mention the fact that he was only testing the notebook out to see if the 13-day rule was real. So the fact that he still openly suspected Light and Misa of being Kida should automatically disqualify him from inheriting his title. A title that Ryuzaki spent years building up and establishing. One synonymous with his skills and his ability as a detective. One that is, quite literally, his own fucking name. Like, it's actually so disrespectful, and yet... In saying that, when you look at the people in this room, I mean, who else could it be? Even Aizawa ends up saying, I can understand how you feel, but you're really the only one of us who can do this. And, I mean, he's right. And to kind of harken back to the first half of this episode, this is another reason why that flashback was worth including. Because we got to see the fact that, from the moment Light was brought on, he was established as being just as good, if not better, than Ryuzaki. So it makes them suggesting this make a lot more sense, despite it being 
kind of fucked up in my opinion. Anyway, despite them wanting him to take on the role, Light plays it smart by not seeming too thrilled by the idea. I don't know. Ryuzaki was killed by Kira because he challenged him, and that's not something I'm eager to do. And I gotta give it to him. That makes a whole lot of sense. I like it even more because it contradicts what he said in the previous episode. I swear I'll avenge Ryuzaki's death. If you're afraid of dying, then leave the investigation. We put our lives on the line when we chose to be here. And I don't mention the fact that it's contradictory as a way to talk shit about him. I think that that actually makes this feel a lot more believable. Like, emotions were running high that night, and you could take his words then as him getting kind of caught up in the moment, given the fact that his mentor and friend was just suddenly murdered. But now, a week later, when things have calmed down, he might have started to rethink some things. Like, I'm so young and I have my whole life ahead of me, you know? <laughs> it's actually super believable that an 18-year-old kid would take pause after having some time to really think about it. So, kudos to him for, you know, really selling it. I may not like this dude, but he really could teach a masterclass on manipulation. Anyway, after they convince him to take on the role, he ends up thinking, Just as I thought, it's too simple. It's no fun without Ryuzaki here. And I want to take note of the look on his face again. Like, it looks like he's smirking, but it almost feels humorless. Like, when I listen to what he's saying, it doesn't sound like he's gloating. He just seems almost apathetic about it all. And I mean, I can understand why he'd feel that way. Imagine going from fighting millennia in Elden Ring to stomping on Goombas in Super Mario. There's just no challenge for him anymore. No one to keep things spicy. But yeah, from there he goes on to say that he'll take the position. And it's kind of funny because this is actually probably the worst decision he could have made. But we'll talk more about that in a later video. Anyway, while he ends up taking the position, he also says that he won't take big risks like challenging Kira directly. And something I want to point out is the fact that the chief ends up responding to Light by saying, Yeah, it's probably better if we play it safe. Ryuzaki may have been a little too confrontational. And my thing is, this approach doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. Because, like, what do you mean you want to play it safe? Like, how exactly do you play it safe and make any sort of progress with this investigation? Like, he says that Ryuzaki was too confrontational, but it's only because he was that way that y'all got to this point. Ryuzaki confronting Kira back in episode 2 is how y'all were able to determine that he was in the Kanto region of Japan. Before that, y'all didn't have any idea where Kira was operating from. Like, it just seems silly to play it safe for this kind of investigation. But I guess, in reality, it doesn't really matter much. I mean, good luck using L to catch Kira when L is Kira. Anyway, from there, they move on to Light's second question, regarding where the new L's base of operations will be. And Light goes on to say that it'll be pretty easy to get things up and running in his room, but he then brings up the fact that it'll be difficult to keep all of this a secret while living with his mom and sister, which leads to him suggesting that he ought to get his own place, and everyone agrees. And this is honestly, like, the perfect situation for Light. Quite frankly, I don't even really understand how he's managed to survive as Kidda for as long as he has, given all the outbursts this dude has had while he's been in his room. I am justice. I'm the one who will become the god of a new world that everyone desires. If I kill him and it turns out he's not really L, that would be like announcing to the real L that I am Kira. I want nothing more than to kill him, but if I do, it's like asking to get caught. Not to mention the fact that Misa was also up there screaming at one point. If you want me to kill her, just say so and I'll kill her. Like, it's actually kind of ridiculous that he hasn't been found out yet. Because in each of those instances, at least one person was home. But whatever, let's just pretend his room is soundproof, I guess. Anyway, like I was saying, this is perfect for him because he'll be able to freely act as Kira whenever he wants without worrying about his family getting in the way. It really doesn't get any more ideal than that. Now, in regard to Light's last question regarding what they ought to do with the notebook, well, Light comes up with a great solution, claiming that since they're the only ones who know about the notebook, one of them should take it and hide it where no one else can find it. Which, I mean, makes sense. The best thing would have been to burn it, but that's not really an option given one of the fake rules in the back of the book. So, since they have to keep it safe, the next best thing is keeping it hidden where no one else can access it. Now it's just a matter of deciding who should have that responsibility. And, I mean, let's be honest, just like Light was the clear choice for who should take on the role of L, it seems just as obvious that the person best suited to take the notebook would be... Uh, I'm sorry, did you have a question, Matsuda? Because if not, I'm going to need you to put your fucking hand down, my guy. Because you know damn well you have no business taking this thing. That responsibility belongs to the chief, and rightfully so. 
Now, while I take issue with his stances on certain things, it doesn't change the fact that he's genuinely a stand-up guy. I especially like the fact that, one, he didn't volunteer for it, because I think that's actually kind of weird to want to be the one who has that responsibility. And two, when Aizawa does suggest that he be the one, he hesitates for a moment before agreeing to it. The reason I point out his hesitation is because that makes sense as a response. The chief understands the weight of the responsibility that they're entrusting him with, and as such, he takes a second to consider it before finally agreeing. I also like the added touch of the sweat marks on his face, showing us how nervous this makes him, despite his tone not giving it away. And I also, also want to point out the fact that his response is very similar to Light's, in the sense that they both hesitate before agreeing. The only difference being the fact that with the chief, it's actually genuine. But I really think it's interesting that Light likely modeled his facade of being good after his father, given how earnest and trustworthy the chief is. Anyway, with their next steps laid out, the conversation shifts to more casual topics, with Matsuda suggesting that they throw a party for Light since he's the new L. Which seems a, a little in poor taste, but I could see why Matsuda would be happy for Light. But as the four of them continue their conversation, we slowly shift our focus towards Light, as the camera zooms in on him and the sound of the other's conversation sort of fades away. And as Light sits at his desk, we see him turn to his left, and what we see is, well, Rizaki. And to be clear, it's not actually Rizaki, but something like an uh, apparition, or maybe better yet, a memory of him, one that Light is currently manifesting. And it seems fairly obvious that this is supposed to show us how Light is still holding on to the memory of Rizaki, that he still misses him or that he's haunted by him. I suppose you could look at it either way, honestly. But regardless, I can especially see why something like this would happen while he's here at headquarters, given the fact that he and Ryuzaki spent months sitting side by side at this very desk. I mean, since they were chained together, they had to have been doing everything together. Sleeping, eating, showering? I mean, I'm sure they had different stalls, but you get what I mean. They were bound together for months, from July 23rd to October 30th, to be exact. So I could see how the idea of turning to his side and not seeing Ryuzaki there would kind of mess with him a little. Now, in addition to seeing Ryuzaki, I also want to take note of Light's eyes, which until now we really didn't get to see during this scene. He mostly had his back to the group, and when we did get a close-up shot of his face earlier, his eyes were closed. But now we see them, and, well, he kind of looks like he did back in episode one. And that makes sense, right? I mean, as he just said, it's no fun without Ryuzaki around. So now, once again, he's bored. There's nothing to really entertain him right now. But that'll change in due time. Anyway, from there, we fast forward a few days where we find Light and Misa out on a lunch date. And still, Light has that detached look in his eyes. They actually use the same image, too. Though this time around, they add a filter to it to match the lighting in this scene. But yeah, he's just pretty much checked out, and Misa's actually kind of upset by it claiming that this is the first date they've had in a while and he just seems so unenthusiastic about it. Which, I mean, has he ever actually been even remotely excited to hang out with her? Though, I guess from her perspective, she probably figured that things would change for them once Ryuzaki was out of the way. And in a way, she was right to assume that, because Light actually ends up saying, Misa, let's move in together. Which, I mean, isn't really too surprising. Sure, he doesn't really like Misa, at all, but at this point, he can't just get rid of her. For one, killing her now would look super suspicious. Like, even if he used accidental death, it would still look weird because now the task force knows for certain that that's a thing someone with a death note can do. Furthermore, getting rid of her doesn't really make a whole lot of sense anyway. I mean, she has the Shinigami eyes, and that's definitely worth having in his back pocket just in case. And further, furthermore, in order to keep up appearances, it makes sense to be in a relationship with someone. Someone. And with that person being Misa, it means that he won't have to worry about keeping secrets from her, both in regard to being L as well as being Kira. Anyway, Misa is thrilled by the news, as she goes on to say, Which, I mean, I, you know what, if she's happy, then whatever. I prefer her being happy like this, as opposed to what we saw in the previous episode. Speaking of which, now that she's back with lights, we can see that she's back to being herself, which does lend credence to the fact that she was only behaving that way because she couldn't use light as a distraction. Anyway, from there, we switch scenes again, this time finding ourselves on the roof of the task force headquarters. And I really like what they've done with this scene, with light standing atop this skyscraper, looking 
looking down on the people of the world. And what makes it even better is the fact that he's not just standing atop a random skyscraper. No, it's the skyscraper that was built by his greatest adversary, a physical testament to Ryuzaki's resolve in regard to Kekshin Kira. And now, <laughs> Light stands atop it, victorious in every sense of the word, as he now not only holds the title of Kira, but also that of L. This scene also seems to pull inspiration from the metaphorical cityscape that we saw back in episode 15, making it literal this time, as he, alone, towers above everyone else, ready to take on his role as the god of the new world. But yeah, Ryuk goes on to say, I guess things are gonna get pretty boring from now on. Which I can understand why you'd think that. I mean, in comparison to the war between L and Kira, anything else would probably seem pretty lackluster. But Light goes on to disagree with Ryuk, saying, That's not true, Ryuk. From this moment on, I'll show you the creation of the new world. And immediately after he says that, we hear the sound of thunder followed by a flash of lightning as the OG Death Note theme starts up. And <laughs> honestly, I really fuck with this scene because it's so extra. Like, it's very reminiscent of the potato chip scene from episode 8 in regard to taking something that's relatively mundane and turning it into something that's <laughs> so much more. Because, to be clear, what happens next is he starts using the Death Note again. For the first time in a while, really. Like, yeah, he killed Higuchi with that scrap in his watch, but that was the extent of his usage. He hasn't actually opened up a Death Note and used it since, what, episode 8? Wait, is that right? Oh shit, yeah, he hasn't actually opened up the Death Note and wrote names directly into it since episode 8. I mean, he's killed people with scraps and pages that he's torn out, but yeah, after he found out someone was in his room, he never actually writes in the Death Note itself again until now. But sorry, that was kind of a tangent. I was more so meaning to point out that he hasn't killed criminals as Kida since before he was incarcerated. And that was nine episodes ago at this point. Over a third of the series so far has seen Light not killing criminals. But that changes now, because your boy is back, and he's <laughs> as dramatic as ever. And honestly, I kind of miss shit like this, because realistically, it's just silly that we're having 30 seconds of build-up for him to just start writing names. Like the way this podium is just slowly coming into focus. A podium of which he had to have dragged out here and set up himself. Or the way we get multiple shots of him doing hand stretches or some shit, which <laughs> just seems like he's getting ready to take out one of those magazines that he bought back in episode eight, if you catch my drift. <laughs> or the way he slowly pulls his arm up with a maroon colored pen in hand, like he's a conductor holding his baton ready to lead a symphony. And trust me, that's not the only shot that gives conductor vibes. Like it's all really kind of ridiculous. And yet for some reason, it just works so well. Like, I'm talking shit about it, sure, but when you're watching it, it feels, it feels like a, like a, like a homecoming. Like daddy's home, if daddy was a teenage homicidal psychopath. But you get what I mean. It just feels like a return to form, to what made this series great to begin with. Which is kind of ironic, given the fact that most people would argue that the show kind of falls apart after this, but more on that later. Anyway, the scene continues with Light going to work. Dude is definitely making up for lost time and he's having fun with it. Look at the flick of their wrist. Look at the flick of their wrist. And even his eyes are back to normal, uh, I guess. However, something I wanted to point out real quick that I noticed is that this news anchor here, uh, apparently she made his hit list because she shows up here like she's on a news program of some sort, but then her image also appears in this scene along with all the people that Light has killed recently. And honestly, I mean, I'm just super curious as to what she must have done to end up there. But anyway, for a minute, I'm rocking with it. Like, yeah, this is what you set out to do. Make the world a better place by getting rid of people committing heinous crimes. So I wasn't really tripping too much about it until I saw this. And I'm just like, man, really? I mean, I get it. He's cleaning house, but damn, man. This just... I think the issue I have with it is the way the show chooses to present these murders in comparison to the others. Because before we see both of them die, we get a memory of Light kind of casually interacting with them, only for it to be ripped apart as we see him write down their names. 
And on top of that, both of their deaths are actually pretty fucked up. Like, Wendy experiences a fiery death after crashing her mo- Oh, hey, it's a kitty! A demonic-looking kitty. Kind of reminds me of my cat Persephone a little bit. <laughs> Evil-ass cat. But anyway, for Ivor, while his death isn't as brutal for him, per se, it is pretty traumatizing for the people closest to him. Because apparently, dude was like Hawkeye from the Avengers and just had a whole secret family tucked away. And unfortunately for them, they're the ones to find his body. Like, I did not expect a 10 second clip to get to me like that. I mean, I don't even really care about Iber, but knowing his son's gonna have to deal with the memory of walking in on his father just keeling over like that is just shit, man. And to kind of go a little deeper with that, Iber was a criminal. I'm not discounting that. By his own admittance, he's a con man, which, I mean, could very well mean that he's used his skills to do some reprehensible things. But we also now see that he's a father and a husband. Like, he's more than just a criminal. And the same could be said for all of the people that Light goes around killing. They're people. They're somebody's daughter, their son, their husband, their wife, their friend, their family. And maybe Light is making the world a better place in some ways by killing certain people, but he's also inflicting a lot of pain on those left behind who cared about those people. But I digress. Now, the next group on Kidda's hit list is actually kind of surprising, because it's the six remaining members of the Yotsuba group. And, I mean, I get why he'd probably want to kill them, since they've seen Matsuda's face and know that he's a part of the task force, given the whole stunt they pulled with Sakura TV. However, killing them just seems like such a crazy thing to do, because, I mean, won't the task force notice that? Like, having all six of these dudes just suddenly die at their main office is going to be on the news. Like, shit, Misa was out there killing random people for, like, a day, and the task force immediately had a list of who those people were within 24 hours. There were 16 deaths just yesterday. So they're definitely gonna notice that these six guys were suddenly killed all at once. And, I mean, does that not seem a, a, a little weird? Like, the guys who were working with the previous kidda all just suddenly died of heart attacks? All at once? <laughs> Like, think about it. The fact that these six random members of this company were killed has to be because they were connected to Kira. Like, why else would they specifically have been killed? And who, besides the now five members of the task force, plus Misa, would even know about their connection to Kira? Oh, well, I guess Weddy and Iber know, but oh, wait, they're dead too. So everyone who's directly involved with this investigation, with the exception of these five plus Misa, are just dead. And we're just not even going to acknowledge it. No? No, we're just going to keep it moving and pretend like that's not a huge red flag? Oh, okay, cool. The fuck? Like, that's actually ridiculous, but whatever. We got to get this time skip ready, so fuck all of that. Even still, though, I can't help but feel bad for these guys. Like, they didn't even ask to be a part of this. Higuchi forced them into it, and now they're all dead because of it. Like, all eight of these deaths are actually really messed up. But anyway, from there, we get a voiceover as the narrator basically goes on to say that we're heading into the future. Five years into the future, to be exact. And let's go ahead and chop this up and talk about it. In April 2012, Light Yagami, age 23, joined Japan's National Police Agency. So, yeah, five years from now, we see that Light is a member of the NPA himself, meaning he's already graduated from college and gone through the police academy. So, that's cool. In the summer of 2012, Kira's killings increased at an unprecedented rate. So, I thought that was kind of interesting. Like, Light was already killing a bunch of criminals. Like, in his first week alone, he had filled up multiple pages of the death note with names. Enough names, in fact, that by the end of that first week, the ICPO had not only become aware of his actions, but also managed to bring together members from all across the world to sit down and discuss the matter. And so, I'm wondering, are they using that as a baseline when they say that the killings increased at an unprecedented rate? Because if so, then damn, that's a lot of people. Like, too many people, right? Like, there's no way he's doing research on hundreds or thousands of criminals' cases while also working full-time as a police officer, on top of the fact that he's also secretly both L and Watari. Like, when do you even sleep, my guy? 
I mean, even if you say Misa is helping out, which I'm sure she is, it still seems a little unreasonable that they would increase at an unprecedented rate after he's gone on to take on more responsibility than he's ever previously had. But anyway. Numerous people around the world were terrified of Kira, and yet there were just as many cheering him on. And this isn't really anything new. I mean, we were seeing evidence of that as early as episode two when we had that montage of people sharing their thoughts about Kira as well as when Light showed Ryuk the different websites that were popping up about him. However, where then it was kind of a vocal minority, now things seem to have escalated. Gradually, their private thoughts became public opinion, and soon, certain nations began to accept Kira's judgment. And this is actually huge. Like, apparently, we've gone from Kira being someone that the ICPO was actively looking to apprehend and execute, to someone that is now being accepted as the rule of law in certain parts of the world. Like, in the five years that have passed, Light has slowly slowly but surely started to accomplish what he set out to do, create a new world. Now, is it a better one? Well, that's open for interpretation, but whoever this narrator is, he clearly has his own thoughts on the matter. The world was heading into a dark age in which Kira's will was the only law. And yeah, things are getting bleak in this world. Anyway, while this little sequence speaks of what the future holds for this world, we take a second to flash back to the past, or the, the present? What I mean is, these final scenes take place in 2007, not 2012. Which is not something that's made super clear, but whatever. Anyway, the following scenes take place on December 5th, 2007. And the first one starts off with the camera approaching a familiar looking computer. And it's actually Ryuzaki's computer from the first couple of episodes of the series. And we see that it has a timer that's counting down. And when it finally hits zero, we see that a transmission is sent out. Now, from there, we transition to the Whammy's house, which, as we went over earlier in this video, is the orphanage founded by Watari that Ryuzaki lived at during his childhood. And it appears as though the aforementioned transmission was sent here, specifically to this man named Roger. And the message is very clear. L is dead. And before we really get a chance to process the message itself, we transition again to Roger sitting solemnly at his desk, clearly distraught from the news of Ryuzaki's passing. I imagine that he knew Ryuzaki pretty well, and it's clear that he was, at the very least, very fond of Watari as we saw him staring at his picture just a second ago. Anyway, as Roger is sitting at his desk, a voice calls out to him. What is it, Roger? Before it pans out and gives us a look at our two new leads, Mello and Nier. But it's a brief introduction. Really brief, actually. In fact, we don't even get to see their faces or hear their names. But best believe, we'll come to know them very well as the series progresses. However, for now, all we get is Roger letting them know that... It's L. He's dead. Before the camera switches to a puzzle with the L insignia brandished on it. And roll credits. Anyway, that's the end of this video, but before we wrap this one up, I wanted to give a shout out to our new editor, Mar, who actually helped me edit this video and who did most of the editing for episode 27, which is currently live over on the Patreon right now, alongside episode two of Code Geass. But yeah, I just wanted to give her a shout out and welcome her to the team, alongside myself and my wife, who, as I brought up before, has been handling all of the thumbnails for the channel ever since episode six. Anyway, I also want to give a shout out to the people over on our Patreon for their contributions to the channel. Starting things off, I want to say thank you to our five admirable assessors. I also want to give a big thanks to all <laughs> 93 of our invaluable investigators. Now, in addition to them, I also want to shout out our eight remarkable researchers. Arrow Falcon Green, Bad Wi-Fi Club, Game and Alchemist, Pellets, The Best, Trinity Schiffer, Vanellian, and Yggdrasil. And lastly, praise be to our seven official overanalyzers. Asia, Seamart, Croy Raiden, Frigid Fox, I am the blonde asshole, Joey Helbig, and Cavarax XE, who actually did the intro for this episode. I just want to say thanks again to all of y'all for helping make these videos possible. It really does mean a lot. But yeah, if you liked this video, then consider dropping a like. If you really liked it, then consider subscribing. And if you just loved it and want to see more sooner, then consider joining the Patreon. Anyway, that's it for this time. Until next time, friends, peace.